deal. He admitted back in the 80s, I never planned for anything. I don't plan ahead. I just show up the office, make phone calls and see what's going to happen. Uh, is that the approach that Donald Trump still seemed to be taking through this once in a century pandemic? Uh, what is uh, really shocking to me and, and I think shocking to people who've looked at this is that he knew it was airborne, that it was going to be a serious situation back in January. The key to understanding this for me was uh, let me take you to that scene of January 28th in the Oval Office when his national security advisor, Robert O'Brien, says the virus will be the biggest threat, the biggest national security threat you will face as president. And then the deputy, Matt Pottinger, stepped in and provided specifics. He'd been a Wall Street Journal reporter in China for seven years, and he knew the Chinese lied about things like this. And he had contacts who told him this is going to be like the 1918 uh, Spanish flu pandemic. And that killed, what, 675,000 people in this country. The president knew this in January. And uh, I did not learn uh, about this meeting, which is the, uh, the opening of my book. I think it's uh, one of the most historic moments in the Oval Office where a crisis is laid out uh, and uh, the president doesn't level with the American people. And uh, it's absolutely tragic. It's tragic for Donald Trump, for the country, for the 190,000 plus people who have died. If he'd been honest and shared the truth in some form, uh, we would be in a completely different uh, position now. It is a, a monumental, catastrophic leadership failure. Let me ask you along those lines, and I want to get to Matt Pottinger for a uh, in a minute, because he actually, as you, as you described in the book, he actually liked Pottinger, trusted him. He was a China hawk. And so Donald Trump was getting this news, not just from his fourth or fifth national security advisor, but from an aide that he trusted uh, whose instincts he trusted. So he, he, he knew it well. But I'm just curious, you, you talked about it being one of the most historic moments uh, in, in the White House in history. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious whether you agree with your uh, former writing partner, Carl Bernstein, that these tapes, these Trump tapes, mm. will be remembered historically uh, as more significant than even the Nixon tapes. Well, it, it, it's hard to compare them. I, I trust uh, Carl's wisdom in this. He, he, he always is forward leaning. Back when we were doing the Nixon reporting, he saw where this was going a year before, quite frankly, I did. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're going to see about this. But the one of the first things when, when I started talking to Trump. Now, this is December 5th last year. I went into the Oval Office and plunked my tape recorder. In fact, I have the tape recorder, an Olympus special. I plunked it down on the Resolute desk and said, this is all on the record. I'm going to record it. I want to find out what your policies have been. This was before the virus. And uh, we went through North Korea. We went through all kind of, for nine hours. And uh, it is a look into his mind. And one, one of the things uh, you, you discover things uh, and it surprised me that the microphone uh, is not just getting words, but it is a microscope. In fact, when you hear the inflections, the anxiety, when you hear the, the anger, when you hear the denial. And uh, so there, there's something in those tapes, which I've, I have in, in the book, uh, probably almost 20% of the book, 
is Trump talking about the virus, talking about the economy, talking about race relations, and you can see, and uh, it's extraordinary. Now, you knew this when you knew Trump years ago, that he will uh, subject himself to a kind of interrogation. So I was able to do that for 10 months, and you, you can not just see it, but you can hear what you can hear uh, this. Uh, it, when I say it's a microscope, it's a magnifying glass also. So you really observe the true Trump, I believe.